Mongol Invasion of Kievan Rus As part of the Mongol invasion of Europe, the Mongol Empire invaded Kievan Rus in the 13th century, destroying numerous cities, including Ryazan, Kalomna, Moscow, Vladimir, and Kiev. The campaign was heralded by the Battle of the Kalka River in May 1223, which resulted in a Mongol victory over the forces of several Rus principalities. The Mongols nevertheless retreated. A full scale invasion of Rus by Badakhan followed, from 1237 to 1242. The invasion was ended by the Mongol succession process upon the death of Ogdi Khan. All Rus principalities were forced to submit to Mongol rule and became part of the Golden Horde Empire, some of which lasted until 1480. The invasion, facilitated by the beginning of the breakup of Kievan Rus in the 13th century, had incalculable ramifications for the history of Eastern Europe, including the division of the East Slavic people into three separate nations, modern-day Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and the rise of the Grand Duchy of Moscow. As it was undergoing fragmentation, Kievan Rus faced the unexpected eruption of an irresistible foreign foe coming from the mysterious regions of the Far East. For our sins, writes the Rus chronicler of the time, unknown nations arrived. No one knew their origin or whence they came, or what religion they practiced. That is known only to God, and perhaps to wise men learned in books. The princes of Rus first heard of the coming Mongol warriors from the nomadic Cumans. Previously known for pillaging settlers on the frontier, the nomads now preferred peaceful relations, warning their neighbors, these terrible strangers have taken our country and tomorrow they will take your scythe you do not come and help us. In response to this call, Mstislav the Bold and Mstislav Romanovich the Old joined forces and set out eastward to meet Thefo, only to be routed on April 1, 1223, at the Battle of the Kalka River. Although this defeat left the Rus principalities at the mercy of invaders, the Mongol forces retreated and did not reappear for 13 years, during which time the princes of Rus went on quarreling and fighting as before until they were startled by a new and much more formidable invading force. In the secret history of the Mongols, the only reference to this early battle is Then he sent Dor by the fierce off against the city of Merv, and on to conquer the people between Iraq and the Indus. He sent Sabete the Brave off to war in the north where he defeated eleven kingdoms and tribes, crossing the Volga and Ural rivers, finally going to war with Kiev. The vast Mongol hordes of around 25,000 mounted archers, commanded by Batakan and Subatai, crossed the Volga River and invaded Volga Bulgaria in late 1236. It took them only a month to extinguish the resistance of the weak Volga Bulgarians, the Cumans Kipchaks and the Alani. In November 1237, Batakan sent his envoys to the court of Yuri II of Vladimir and demanded his submission. A month later, the hordes besieged Ryazan. After six days of bloody battle, the city was totally annihilated and inhabitants slaughtered. Alarmed by the news, Yuri II sent his sons to detain the invaders, but they were defeated and ran for their lives. Having burnt down Kalamna in Moscow, the horde laid siege to Vladimir on February 4, 1238. Three days later, the capital of Vladimir Suzdal was taken and burnt to the ground. The royal family perished in the fire, while the Grand Prince retreated northward. Crossing the Volga, he mustered a new army, which was encircled and totally annihilated by the Mongols in the Battle of the Sit River on March 4. Thereupon Badakhan divided his army into smaller units, which ransacked 14 cities of modern-day Russia, Rostov, Uglik, Yaroslavl, Kostroma, Kashin, Ksnyatin, Gordyets, Galak, Firoslavl Zaleski, Yuriya Polsky, Dmitriv, Volokolamsk, Tver, and Torzhuk. Chinese siege engines were used by the Mongols under Tuluy to raise the walls of Russian cities. The most difficult to take was the small town of Kozolsk, whose boy Prince Vasily, son of Titus, and inhabitants resisted the Mongols for seven weeks, killing 4,000. As the story goes, at the news of the Mongol approach, the whole town of Kitesh with all its inhabitants was submerged into a lake, where, as legend has it, it may be seen to this day. The only major cities to escape destruction were Novgorod and Peskov. The Mongols planned to advance on Novgorod, but the principality was spared the fate of its brethren by the wise decision to preemptively surrender. In mid-1238, Batukhan devastated the Crimea and pacified Mordovia. In the winter of 1239, he sacked Chernigov and Pereyaslav. After many days of siege, the horde stormed Kiev in December 1240. Despite the resistance of Daniel of Halish, Batukhan managed to take two of his principal cities, Halish and Vladimir Volinsky. 
the Mongols then resolved to reach the ultimate sea, where they could proceed no further, and invaded Hungary and Poland. Batakan captured Pest, and then on Christmas Day 1241, Estergom. This time the invaders came to stay, and they built for themselves a capital, called Sarai, on the lower Volga. Here the commander of the Golden Horde, as the western section of the Mongol Empire was called, fixed his golden headquarters and represented his sovereign the Grand Khan who lived with the Great Horde in the Orkan Valley. Here they had their headquarters and held parts of Rus in subjection for nearly three centuries. All of the Russian states, including Novgorod, Smolensk, Galak, and Peskov, submitted to the Tatar Mongol rule. The term by which this subjection is commonly designated, the Mongol or Tatar yoke, suggests terrible oppression, but in reality these nomadic invaders from Mongolia were not such cruel, oppressive taskmasters. In the first place, they never settled in the country, and they had little direct dealing with the inhabitants. In accordance with the admonitions of Genghis Khan to his children and grandchildren, they retained their pastoral mode of life, so that the subject races, agriculturists and dwellers in towns were not disturbed in their ordinary avocations. Golden Horde instituted census, taxes and tributes on the conquered lands, which were usually collected by local princes and brought to Sarai. It was only in the 14th and 15th centuries, with the rise of the Tatar Khanates, that slave raids on the Slavic population became significant, with the purpose of trading slaves with the Ottoman Empire. The raids were an important drain of the human and economic resources of both Muscovy and the Grand Duchy of Lithuania, and they largely prevented the settlement of the wild fields, the steppe and forest steppe land extending from about a hundred miles south of Moscow to the Black Sea, and they ultimately contributed to the development of the Cossacks. In religious matters, the Mongols were extremely tolerant. When they first appeared in Europe, they were shamanists, and as such they had no religious fanaticism. After adopting Islam they remained as tolerant as before, and the Khan of the Golden Horde, who first became a Muslim, allowed the Rus to found a Christian bishopric in his capital. Nagai Khan, half a century later, married a daughter of the Byzantine emperor and gave his own daughter in marriage to a Rus prince, Theodore the Black. Some modern revisionist Russian historians even postulate that there was no invasion at all. According to them, the Rus princes concluded a defensive alliance with the Horde in order to repel attacks of the fanatical Teutonic Knights, which posed a much greater threat to the Rus religion and culture. These points represent the bright side of Tatar rule, but it also had its dark side. So long as a great horde of nomads was encamped on the frontier, the country was liable to be invaded by an overwhelming force. These invasions were not frequent, but when they occurred they caused an incalculable amount of devastation and suffering. In the intervals the people had to pay a fixed tribute. At first it was collected in a rough and ready fashion by Tatar tax gatherers, by about 1259 it was regulated by a census of the population, and finally its collection was entrusted to the native princes, so the people were no longer brought into direct contact with the Tatar officials. The influence of the Mongol invasion on the territories of Kievan Rus was uneven. Colin McAvity estimates the population of Kievan Rus dropped from 7.5 million prior to the invasion to 7 million afterwards. Centers such as Kiev took centuries to rebuild and recover from the devastation of the initial attack. The Novgorod Republic continued to prosper, and new entities, the rival cities of Moscow and Tver, began to flourish under the Mongols. Moscow's eventual dominance of northern and eastern Rus was in large part attributable to the Mongols. After the Prince of Tver joined a rebellion against the Mongols in 1327, his rival Prince Ivan I of Moscow joined the Mongols in crushing Tver and devastating its lands. By doing so he eliminated his rival, allowed the Russian Orthodox Church to move its headquarters to Moscow and was granted the title of Grand Prince by the Mongols. As such, the Muscovite prince became the chief intermediary between the Mongol overlords and the Rus lands, which paid further dividends for Moscow's rulers. While the Mongols often raided other areas of Rus, they tended to respect the lands controlled by their principal collaborator. This, in turn, attracted nobles and their servants who sought to settle in the relatively secure and peaceful Moscow lands. Although Rus forces defeated the Golden Horde at the Battle of Kulikovo in 1380, Mongol domination of parts of Rus territories, with the requisite demands of tribute, continued until the Great Stand on the Uyghur River in 1480. Historians argued that without the Mongol destruction of Kievan Rus, the Rus would not have unified into the Tsardom of Russia and, subsequently, the Russian Empire would not have risen. Trade routes with the East went through Rus territory, making them a center of trade between East and West. Mongol influence, 
while destructive to their enemies, had a significant long-term effect on the rise of modern Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. The Mongol conquest of Rus left a deep mark on Russian historiography. The ability of pagan nomads from Inner Asia to subjugate Russia is according to Charles Ch. Halpern a source of embarrassment among the educated Russian society. This embarrassment is thought to be a contributing cause to the emergence of new chronology pseudo-history that claims the conquest is a forgery. Historians have debated the long-term influence of Mongol rule on Rus society. The Mongols have been blamed for the destruction of Kievan Rus, the breakup of the ancient Rus nationality into three components and the introduction of the concept of Oriental despotism into Russia. Historians also credit the Mongol regime with an important role in the development of Muscovy as a state. Under Mongol occupation, for example, Muscovy developed its Mesnichestbo hierarchy, postal road network, census, fiscal system and military organization. The period of Mongol rule over Russia included significant cultural and interpersonal contacts between the Russian and Mongolian ruling classes. By 1450, the Tatar language had become fashionable in the court of the Grand Prince of Moscow, Vasily II, who was accused of excessive love of the Tatars and their speech, and many Russian noblemen adopted Tatar surnames. Many Russian boyar families traced their descent from the Mongols or Tatars, including Velyaminovsernov, Godunov, Arsenyev, Bakhmetev. Bulgakov and Chadaev. In a survey of Russian noble families of the 17th century, over 15% of the Russian noble families had Tatar or Oriental origins. The Mongols brought about changes in the economic power of states and overall trade. In the religious sphere, St. Paphnutius of Borovsk was the grandson of a Mongol Baskok, or tax collector, while a nephew of Khan Burgai of the Golden Horde converted to Christianity and became known as the monk St. Peter Tsarevich of the Horde. In the judicial sphere, under Mongol influence capital punishment, which during the times of Kievan Rus had only been applied to slaves, became widespread, and the use of torture became a regular part of criminal procedure. Specific punishments introduced in Moscow included beheading for alleged traitors and branding of thieves. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.